When you think about the cleanest place on the planet, what do you think of? Some of you with kids are thinking, well, I know what it's not. Uh, but what do you think of the cleanest place on the planet? What do you think of? So I did a little research in asking the question, and some of the answers that came up is, uh, for instance, a class one clean room. So a class one clean room are these clean rooms in research facilities or manufacturing facilities, uh, places that make medicine, those kinds of things, these very clean spaces. Um, and so they try, in these rooms, they try to remove particles that are larger than 0.5 micrometers per cubic meter of air. I have no idea what that means, but very small particles nonetheless. Normal air has 35 million of these particles. These clean rooms try to have less than three. And that gives you a, little, a sense of what they're trying to do in this clean room. Uh, or you may think of a vacuum chamber. A vacuum chamber, chamber is a sealed enclosure. So they seal the enclosure and then they try to suck out everything out of that space. And all particles, not just of any size, they want to get every particle out of that space. So normal air has 10 trillion particles of various sizes. In a vacuum chamber, they try to remove everything they can, but they only want to leave less than 100 particles in the area, in the vacuum cleaner chamber. But the cleanest place on the planet is probably the Large Hadron Collider. I've heard of the Large Hadron Collider in, in uh, uh, CERN, that area. Uh, but this is the 27-kilometer circle that they shoot particles through so that they can collide these particles and try to create collisions. 27 kilometers. Uh, it, is, it is an absolute vacuum. It's an ultra-high vacuum. It's advertised as the emptiest space in our solar system. Pretty incredible, all underground, how they get this incredible vacuum. So whatever you think of of a clean room, either a, a class one clean, clean room or the Hadron Collider, whatever, whenever you want to create a clean space, the non-scientific explanation of that is pretty simple, right? First thing you got to do is make sure that you get everything that's dirty out of the space. So if you're going to clean a vacuum chamber, you got to get everything dirty out. Or this Hadron Collider, you got to get everything dirty out. And then the second thing that you got to do is make sure that you don't let any dirt come in. So you've got to remove all the contaminants, and then you've got to make sure no contamination comes in. So if you've got a class one clean room, and you've got it all cleaned up, and then you let some guy walk in who just got off the farm milking the cows and stepped into your class one clean room, you no longer have a clean room, you just got a room. And you've got to start over, right? You're going to have to remove all the dirt, and you've got to make sure no new dirt comes in. So I just put that image before you to, to think of heaven in this way. What if we thought of heaven as the ultimate clean space. I mean, isn't that kind of our hope of what heaven's going to be like? That when we get to heaven, God is going to remove everything that contaminates will be out of heaven. So all hate, all injustice, all lying, all stealing, all murder, all envy, all pride, all jealousy, everything that would contaminate that space, God would remove and keep it perfectly clean. So, but if you're going to get a, a space clean, not only do you have to remove all the contaminants out of it, you've got to make sure you don't let anything dirty get in. So here's the real question. If heaven is going to be this ultimate clean space, how in the world is God ever going to allow you and I to come in? Because if he allows you and I to come in, and we have this sin nature, and out of our sin nature we always are going to act sinfully, what that means is... God can get this ultimate clean space called heaven totally free of any contaminants, but as soon as he lets me in, it's unclean. The whole thing is, might as well have been milking cows, stepped into the class one clean room, right? And as soon as he lets you in, same thing's going to happen. So how are we going to get into this ultimate clean space? How are we going to get into heaven? We've been talking about this the last few weeks, about what's wrong with humanity, and we're looking at this Bible word, sin, and the problem is not so much that humans do sinful things, the problem is even much greater than that. The problem is that we have a sin nature, and out of our sin nature, we're constantly doing sinful things. So we are all under sin. We, none of us are righteous, no, not one. And so unless God does something about this sin nature, we're going to continue to act out of this sin nature and do sinful things. We looked at last week, the wages of sin is death, physical death, spiritual death, eternal death, that if God just leaves us like that, then we're just going to have the sin nature and we'll spend eternity in eternal death. So how is this problem solved? 
Well, you all being church people know that the problem is going to have something to do with the word Jesus, right? It's like the old joke says, the Sunday, little three-year-old Sunday school classroom that the teacher is saying, you know, what's got four legs and a tail and barks? And the little three-year-old girl says, well, it sounds like a dog, but I'm going to go ahead and guess Jesus because that's the answer to everything else, right? So it's always Jesus is always a safe answer. So yes, Jesus is how we solve the sin problem. The problem is many of us have a, a Twitter understanding of the gospel. Now, how many of y'all have Twitter accounts? Come on, how many of y'all have Twitter accounts? Really, is it that small? First service, there were like two hands. I thought, well, for surely the second service, there's going to be a lot more. So Snapchat, Instagram, whatever. I mean, Twitter has 140 characters. And for a lot of people, that's basically their understanding of the gospel. Jesus died on the cross for our sins. That's it. The problem is, if that's all you know, it may not lead you to salvation. The problem, if that's all you know, is you have a very anemic understanding of what salvation is all about. It might make you religious, but it's not going to deal with the sin nature that's inside of you so that you can ever step into this ultimate clean space called heaven. So what I want us to do today, we're going to read a paragraph from Romans chapter 3. And I want to challenge you today to think deeply about what Jesus has done and how you and I respond to that so that this sin nature can be dealt with, so that you and I can enter into this ultimate clean space called heaven. So we're reading from Romans chapter 3. If you notice in your bulletin, not only do you have the same translation I'm reading, but there's some color-coded stuff going on uh, so that we can look at specific phrases, and I want you to see where they come from out of Romans chapter 3. So beginning verse 21. But now the righteousness of God has been manifested apart from the law, Although the law and the prophets bear witness to it, the righteousness of God through faith in Jesus Christ for all who believe. There's no distinction. All have sinned and fall short of the glory of God and are justified by His grace as a gift through the redemption that's in Christ Jesus, whom God put forward as a propitiation by His blood to be received by faith. This was to show God's righteousness, because in his divine forbearance, he had passed over former sins, and it was to show his righteousness at the present time, so that he might be just and the justifier of the one who has faith in Jesus. Now that paragraph is a very thick paragraph, and there's a lot of words in there. You may know exactly everything that Paul said righteousness, justification, propitiation. You probably talk like this all the time, right? Uh, but for some of us, we read these phrases and think, well, that, I kind of know what that means, but I'm not exactly sure what that means. So what I want us to do today is look at these five phrases out of Romans 3, try to break them down. I'm going to try to do my best to put about 2,000 years of church history and Christian theology into about, you know, 12 minutes. So hang on, we're going to ride quick. So I want us to look at these five phrases because I want you to have a deep and full understanding of salvation so that when you sing songs and you sing phrases, you understand everything that's behind them so you can worship with all of your heart, mind, and soul. So the first phrase is there in yellow out of verse 22. It talks about the righteousness of God through faith in Jesus Christ for all who believe. When we talk about the righteousness of God, what are we talking about? We're talking about two things. Scripture uses this phrase you know, the subjective genitive and the objective genitive, I won't go into all that, but there's two sides of that. It talks, to number one, about the righteousness that God requires. The righteousness that God requires. We talk about the righteousness of God, we're saying this is the righteousness that God requires in order for you and for me to be in a right relationship with God, to have fellowship with God, ultimately to spend eternity with God in His ultimate clean space. This is the standard that God Require. So what does verse 23 say? For all have sinned and fall short of not being pretty good. No, that's not what it says. For all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. The glory of God is the righteous standard that God requires. Some people who have a Twitter understanding of the gospel, if you ask them enough questions and you talk to them enough, they'll, they'll say something to you like this. Have you ever heard anybody say this to you? I don't think I have ever done anything bad enough to go to hell. Right? Have you heard people say that before? I don't think I've ever done anything bad enough to go to hell. And what they are saying is, instead of the standard being this high in order to get into heaven, 
the standard is just this low in order to be sent to hell. And you understand the difference, right? So this would be a minimal bar as long as you haven't killed anybody or, you know, been a mass murderer. You're pretty much above the bar. And so as long as you haven't done that, you get in to heaven. But the righteousness of God says the standard that God requires is not this low bar mark. The standard that God requires is the righteousness of God, the absolute perfection of who God is and what God does, which is why Paul has said in Romans 3, we have all fallen short of this standard. The righteousness that God requires is way up here. So we talk about the righteousness of God. Number one, it's the righteousness uh, that God requires. It's the standard by which we are measured. But it's also the righteousness that God gives. Here's the incredible thing about the gospel. Not only is this the righteous standard that God requires, but God also gives us his righteousness so that we meet the standard. Isn't that an incredible idea? So in the gospel, there is this incredible exchange that takes place. My sinfulness and Christ's righteousness, there is a trade. He, my sinfulness was placed upon Jesus on the cross his righteousness was placed upon me. It's the righteousness that I receive. And so when God looks at me, the righteousness that he requires is also the righteousness that he gives to me. This is why Paul says in Philippians chapter 3, his desire is to be found not having a righteousness of my own that comes from the law, but that which comes through faith in Christ, the righteousness from God that depends on on faith. Paul says, this is what I want. I don't want my own righteousness by how good of a person I am. I want the righteousness that God gives because that's the righteousness that God requires. So that's the first phrase. The second phrase is in green. It's there in verse 24. Justified by his grace as a gift. We are justified by his grace as a gift. Now the word justification comes from a courtroom setting. The word justification means when a judge declares a defendant not guilty. So the defendant comes before the judge and the case has been made and the judge says you are not guilty. You are, you may have heard this before, just as if you have never sinned. You are not guilty. You are justified. Now the phrase justification by grace through faith, justification by grace through faith, that was the entire basis of the Protestant Reformation. So you may have heard about this little thing called the Protestant Reformation. The 500th, 500th anniversary of that is this October. Uh, and the entire reason that there was a group of people who protested against what the Catholic Church was teaching was this idea of justification by faith. Pew Research uh, Foundation recently did a survey because of the 500th anniversaries coming up of the Protestant Reformation, surveying people asking how much they understood about what this phrase means and about what the difference is between Protestant and Catholic. And what was interesting about that survey was people basically don't have any clue about the significance of that phrase and what the difference in understanding is. And so I, I want you to know, understand that. So the Catholic understanding of justification by faith and I'm not trying to disparage Catholics or anything. This is their official church doctrine. You can read Vatican II. They reaffirm this in Vatican II. So this is their official teaching. They, they stand behind this. When they say we are justified by faith, what they say is when we put our faith in Jesus, God gives us enough grace so that we actually can become righteous so that when we become the righteousness of God, then the judge will look at us and say, hey, you're not guilty. Now you can come in to my heaven. In other words, when we put our faith in Jesus, God gives us enough help so now that we can actually become sinless. And the way that we actually become sinless is through a series of confession when you sin and then penance, which is stuff that you have to do in uh, payment for your sin, punishment for your sin, and then also through good works. You do enough of this and become good enough and become holy enough, you can actually become the righteousness of God, and then the judge will look at you and say, hey, you're not guilty. You get to come in. Now, you're probably not going to get this done in your lifetime, which is why the Catholic Church teaches there's a place called purgatory, and you'll spend as long as you need in purgatory of becoming 
better and better and better until you actually get to this place where you are the righteousness of God and the judge says you're not guilty. That is the Catholic understanding, uh, affirmed once again in Vatican, Vatican II and their council. The, in the Protestant Reformation were a group of people who began to read Romans and were protesting against that and say, hey, wait a minute. What the scripture says is that we are justified by his grace as a gift. We're justified by his grace as a gift as a gift. And what Romans teaches is that we are justified as a gift. We are justified when we put our faith in Jesus, then the judge looks at us and says, because of your faith in Jesus, you are not guilty. And because we are justified and we receive the Holy Spirit inside of us that begins to sanctify us, we do good works, but the good works are a demonstration that we have been justified not a means to earn justification. Is there a difference? Does that make sense? Someone nod their head, yes, this way, this way, okay. So the Romans teaches us that when we are justified, we will do good works, but it's not to earn our justification, it's because we are justified. The Catholic teaching says you do good works so that you can earn your justification, so that you can become good enough so that you're worthy of entering into the ultimate clean space called heaven. Huge difference. And so this is why Paul wrote in, in Romans chapter 3 and verse 20, the verse right before the paragraph we read, by works of the law, no human will be justified in his sight. Or in Ephesians 2, by grace you have been saved through faith that is not your own doing, it is the gift of God, it is not a result of works so that no one may boast. Our understanding of what justification means as it comes out of Romans chapter 3 is huge. The judge has looked at you and said, you're not guilty. And it's not because anything that you have done to become worthy of the judge looking at you and saying you're not guilty. It is a gift. And it is his grace. We are justified by his grace as a gift. Let's look at the phrase that's highlighted in blue, the next phrase in verse 24. Through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus. Now, redemption. Redemption is a word that comes from the world of slavery. So, in first century Rome, uh, slavery was very prominent, and there are a lot of ways you could become a slave. The two most uh, prominent ways, you could either be a prisoner of war. The Roman army went out and conquered a territory. The they would capture people and bring them back and sell them as slaves. So you'd be a prisoner of war and become a slave. Or you could be in debtor's prison. So if you owed a lot of money and you couldn't pay it off, you would go to, to debtor's prison and you would work as a slave to pay off your debt until your debt uh, was paid. So if you were going to get out of that institution, your only hope was that someone would come along and they would purchase you out of slavery. If you were in debtor's prison, they'd come along and say, well, you owe $20,000, I'll pay, your, pay off your debt. Now you're set free. Or if you were a prisoner of war from, and become a slave, well, what, what's the value? What's the relative value of you as a slave? I'll pay that price to the owner and you are free. So this word redemption is a word that means to buy one back from slavery. To be redeemed is that we were enslaved and we have been purchased back. Now it's very key to, to note what Paul wrote in Romans chapter 6 here in your notes. Thanks be to God that, that you who were once slaves of sin have become obedient from the heart to the standard of teaching to which you were committed, and having been set free from sin, you have become slaves of righteousness. Very important to see that. that when we talk about being redeemed in Christ, we are talking about being purchased out of slavery to sin and becoming slaves of Christ. Both out of sin, into being slaves of Christ. So Paul begins this entire letter to the church at Rome. He says, Paul, a slave of Christ. Chapter 1, verse 1. Some of your translations say servant, but it's the word for slave. Paul, a slave of Christ, because he understood, when I'm redeemed, I used to be a slave of sin, now I have been set free, and now I am a slave of Jesus Christ. So the Twitter gospel that says... I believe that Jesus died on the cross for my sins, but it just doesn't really make that much of a difference in my life now. That's a person who has no understanding of what redemption means. How can it make no difference in your life 
to be redeemed from slavery to sin and now be a slave to Christ in righteousness and to say, it's not really made that much of a difference in my life. You understand why it's important to have the full picture here? Part of salvation is that we've been redeemed. We are no longer slaves to sin. We are now slaves to Christ. Or look at this phrase in red. Verse 25, God put forward as a propitiation by his blood. Isn't that a great Bible word? Propitiation. How many of y'all use that word this week? Just been work somewhere around? Yeah. We never use this word. The word propitiation means to satisfy the wrath of someone. To satisfy the wrath. Someone is very angry. There's a wrath that is there. And so when they are propitiated, they're satisfied. Their wrath has been satisfied. So we read in Romans, the wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and the unrighteousness of men. If you look in Ephesians 2 and it talks about the gospel, it says we were dead in our sins and we were by nature objects of God's wrath. So if God's wrath is revealed against all unrighteousness and you and I have a sin nature and out of that sin nature we continue to do unrighteous things, then God's wrath is revealed against us. So how does that wrath ever get satisfied? That's what Paul's talking about, propitiation by his blood. Now, the, the, the picture in Scripture that really helps us understand that, if you go back to the book of Leviticus, so Paul, uh, God in Leviticus was, was sharing with Moses, telling Moses the sacrificial system. And so God said, Moses, tell the people that when they sin, they bring to uh, the tabernacle either a, a bull or a goat, so depending upon... Uh, how wealthy they are, uh, but they bring a, a goat to the tabernacle, they lay their hands on the, the goat, they confess their sins, and then that goat will be sacrificed, and then there's this phrase that says, and it shall be accepted as atonement for his sins. It shall be accepted as atonement for his sins. What's the word atonement mean? Atonement is the Hebrew word for the New Testament Greek word propitiation. It's the same word. In other words, God is saying, the, my wrath is against your sin, but if you come to the tabernacle and you confess your sin upon this animal and this animal is sacrificed in your place, my wrath for your sin will be satisfied because I will accept the blood of this animal instead of yours. So we take that to the new covenant where Jesus Christ dies on the cross and he is the propitiation for our sins. What the scriptures are saying to us is the wrath of God that is revealed against our sin will be satisfied because in faith we confess our sins upon Jesus and God says, I will accept the blood of Jesus for your sins and my wrath will be satisfied. I mean, think about this. 2 Thessalonians chapter 1, read it sometime. It describes when Jesus returns what Jesus is going to do. And when Jesus comes back, it says that he is going, his wrath will be revealed against everything that is evil and unrighteous and will destroy it all. How come you and I aren't on that list? I mean, we always talk about the trumpet sounds and Jesus comes back and how excited we are. If Jesus is coming back to destroy everything that's evil, shouldn't you and I be really afraid? Unless the wrath of God has been satisfied by the blood of Jesus. And so when Jesus returns to, to destroy evil... We are not on the list, and it's not because we have become so good. Jesus says, oh, wow, look at you, you're good. It's because his wrath has been satisfied through the blood of Jesus Christ, because he has accepted the blood of Jesus in our place. So this great phrase, the propitiation by his blood, is good news. Not only am I right relationship now with God, because he has accepted Jesus' blood in my place, but when Christ returns... His wrath on me has been satisfied by the blood of Jesus. Incredible news. The fifth statement there, it's the one that's underlined, primarily because I ran out of colors in the Microsoft Word highlighting program. Uh, to be received by faith. To be received by faith. So the incredible thing about all this, the righteousness that God requires is the righteousness that he gives. We are justified by his grace as a gift, we are redeemed out of slavery to become slaves of righteousness. We have this propitiation, so God's wrath is satisfied. How does all of that come to you and to me? By faith. Isn't that pretty incredible? 
simply by putting our faith in Jesus Christ. Now, what does faith mean? Uh, There's a lot of different definitions of faith. I found this in in one of the research articles I was reading this week. I thought the, the statement was very enlightening. Faith is believing that God will do in us and through us that which he both requires and that which he gives. Faith is believing that God will do in in us and through us that which he requires, his righteous standard, that he's actually going to meet this standard by what he gives, which is justification and propitiation and redemption through Jesus Christ. And because of all of that, the righteous standard of God is met. Faith is believing that what God requires, God will provide through Jesus Christ. And believing all of that takes place. So I also said the second phrase there. Faith includes the full, ongoing, inseparable works of grace. The first work of grace is justification. We've already talked about that. To be declared not guilty by the judge. The second one is sanctification. Sanctification is the process of being made holy. It is the process of the Spirit of God inside of us transforming us into the image of Christ. So Romans 6, 22 there in your notes, now that you've been set free from sin and you've become slaves of God, again, notice the full uh, completion of redemption there, the fruit you get leads to sanctification and then to its end, which is eternal life. So faith includes the full, ongoing, inseparable works of grace, justification, being declared not guilty by the judge, sanctification, actually being made holy through the work of God's grace, and glorification, which is being welcomed into eternal life. Now, here's the deal with the Twitter gospel. There are a lot of people who say, hey, I believe in justification, and I am so looking forward to glorification, but I'm not so much interested in sanctification. I I want to be declared not guilty by the judge, and I certainly want to go to heaven when I die, but but I don't want to get all radical about following Jesus and, and becoming holy and being free from sin. I'm not all that interested in sanctification. Well, if you look at everything that Paul has written in this paragraph, how in the world can you be justified and look forward to being glorified and not be passionate about being sanctified? That's when we talk about the full, ongoing, inseparable works of grace. Those who have been justified will be sanctified, and those who are being sanctified will be glorified. So next week we're going to talk about this battle of sanctification, because even after we have been justified and redeemed, our sin nature has been defeated, but it's not eliminated. And this sin nature will not be completely redeemed until Christ returns and our bodies are redeemed and our sin nature is annihilated. Until then, we do battle against this sin nature. We cooperate with the Spirit of God in sanctification. So next week, we're going to talk about how it is we cooperate with the Spirit of God in the process of being made holy. But what I want to leave you with is here in the box at the bottom of your bulletin. The righteousness that God requires is a gift that God gives that is received by faith. The faith that justifies the sinner, sanctifies the saved, and leads to eternal life. Now what I hope happens this morning, if you can say that statement in the box describes my faith. The righteousness that God requires is a gift that God has given to me that I have received by faith. And this faith has not only justified me as a sinner, but it is sanctifying me as a saint, and it will glorify me into eternal life. My hope is if you can say that, then everything else in Romans 3 in this paragraph empowers your worship. So that when you, when you sing songs that say something about the word redeemed, that it's not just a word that you sing, but Romans 3 will come to mind. I have been set free from sin. The power of sin has been broken. I've been transferred from the kingdom of darkness to the kingdom of light. I am now a slave of righteousness. And so I can sing, redeemed, how I love to proclaim. Or when we see this word propitiation, or anytime we see the word the blood of Jesus, you understand what that means. That the wrath of God that should be revealed against my unrighteousness has been satisfied. 
God is no longer angry at me. God is at peace with me. God looks at me with love and favor and affection because all of the wrath aimed at me has now been placed in the blood of Jesus and I am accepted in his sight. Every time you sing the blood of Jesus, you know what that means. Or when you sing righteousness, that word righteousness, you'll think the righteousness that God requires and the righteousness that God gives. What we sing earlier, dressed in his righteousness alone, faultless to stand before the throne. I mean, what an incredible phrase to sing. You and I are going to stand before the King of Kings, the Lord of Lords, the moral ruler of the universe, and we're going to be faultless? Are you kidding me? How is that going to happen? Because we are dressed in His righteousness alone. The very righteousness that He requires is the very righteousness that He has given. And now we are dressed in His righteousness alone, faultless to stand before the throne. So I hope that because of this, this enriches your worship, it enriches your singing, it enriches your scripture reading. But I do pray that if what's in this box does not describe you, if, you can, if you're saying, you know, I just thought it was kind of a, you know, just kind of believe in Jesus kind of thing, just kind of like I believe in the North Pole, I believe in Jesus, I just thought it was just kind of a believing thing and that was it, that's all you had to do. I didn't realize that there was this faith that leads to justification and sanctification and glorification. And through this, that God has opened your eyes to the full gospel and to say, this has never really happened in me. I would call you today, say today is the day to put your faith in Jesus Christ. To hear the righteousness that he requires is the righteousness that he gives. That you can be justified as as a gift by his grace. They can liberate you from the power of sin and make you a, a slave of righteousness. You can satisfy the wrath of God. May today be the day that is true of you. You can say, I put my faith in Jesus Christ as my Lord and Savior. Would you pray with me this morning?